Let's uh, go ahead and open in a word of prayer and we'll get started. Father, we're grateful for this particular day. And um, we look at today as a work of your grace. We weren't guaranteed today, but you gave it to us. And so we just pray that we would be good stewards of it and we would worship you today here at Sugarland Bible Church in spirit and truth. And we would develop this week in our walk with you that we could glorify you with all of our heart, mind, and soul. And so um, I just pray that you'll use our studies today and your word to fortify us with the things that we need as we seek to live for you as your people in these last days. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. Well, let's take our Bibles, if we could, and open them to the book of Revelation, chapter 13, and verses 16 through 18. Usually I'm just so excited to get here, but I wasn't today. The reason for that is I'm spoiled because I spent all last week at Disneyland. And you guys are wonderful, but Disneyland's the best. I'm sorry. (laughs) That's a joke. But um, I did have a mild trauma while I was there. On the Pirates of the Caribbean ride, my Sugarland Bible Church hat, which I proudly wear, fell off my head. And I, you know, I was sort of depressed about it for the rest of the ride because I kept looking behind me, no, no hat, no hat. And just as we were getting off the ride, some guy in the very back, I was in the front, had caught the hat. And so my my hat has been returned to me. And so the trauma has overcome. Though Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. So let's close in prayer. No. (laughs) But anyway, it is very good to be back. We're just a little bit lagging because we're still on West Coast time. But um, let's talk about the Antichrist, shall we? Revelation 13, verses 16 through 18. Continuing on, uh, nearing towards the end, believe it or not, our study on the rapture having already defined in this study what is the rapture, from there moving into when is the rapture, gave you seven reasons why we believe the church will not be on the earth when the tribulation period occurs, from there moving into strengthening the pre-tribulational case, by looking at a lot of other passages, which we hadn't had a chance to comment on yet. So we went through all of those, and then we went through the opposing views. That took some time. So those are the views that are competing against our view in terms of the timing of the rapture. And we're sort of wrapping up the series by taking a look at what's gonna happen one second after the rapture. So you can divide this into three parts. What's going to happen one second after the rapture for the believer? What's going to happen one second after the rapture for the unbeliever? And then finally, who cares? Why does it matter? So for the believer, there's three things to look forward to. These all begin with the letter R. What's going to happen for the Christian one second after the rapture? A, reunion. B, resurrection. C, reward. Three R's. What's going to happen for the unbeliever one second after the rapture? And we're just barely into this section here. But we believe, first and foremost, there's going to be a very perverted explanation for all of the missing people. Um, You see this in the writings of the New Age movement going back decades. The people that were taken are all the people that do not fit here anymore because they are stopping the harmony of the earth. So they're going to, I believe, spin it in terms of 
the rapture is not a good thing, but a negative thing. Well, I, I guess let me put it, let me, let me rephrase it. The people taken in the rapture, they're not taken away into blessing. They're taken away because they're a, a curse. So, and whereas we would look at the earth as in a state of, now the earth is in trouble because the rapture has occurred, because now the earth becomes the candidate for God's wrath, more on that in a second, they're going to look at it as, well, the earth is now ready to move into its next state of development. So that's why I call this a perverted explanation. So we talked our way through that. We also talked our way through last time how there's going to be a radical change in God's program one second after the rapture. Number one, from the church to Israel, the church will exit the scene and God will put his hand back on the nation of Israel because God has unfinished business with the nation of Israel. There's language concerning Israel which has never been exhausted. When is God going to fulfill that language? He's going to fulfill it in the events of the Great Tribulation period and the Millennial Kingdom which follows. And number two, or second, secondarily, there's going to be a change in the Holy Spirit's operation. So what the Holy Spirit has been doing since the day of Pentecost, you'll find it there in the right-hand column. What he was doing in the Old Testament era up until Acts 1, you'll find in the middle column. So the big deal with Acts 2 is that the work of the Spirit shifted from the middle column to the right-hand column. And the Holy Spirit is operating today in a way through his people, God's people, that the Holy Spirit has never operated in. So we're truly living in the age of the Holy Spirit. One second after the rapture, just like on the day of Pentecost, there was a switch from the red to the blue. One second after the rapture, there's going to be a switch from the blue back to the red. Because Israel has one week left in a time clock that God gave through Gabriel to Daniel. 483 of the 490 years have elapsed. One seven-year increment is remaining. So how the Holy Spirit worked in those prior 483 years is exactly how he's going to work in the final seven years, which we call the Great Tribulation Period. Because that whole package concerns Israel, not the church. So one second after the rapture, there's going to be a tremendous change in those two areas. And here is new material, and we pick it up here brand new this morning. The third thing that will happen, and again, I don't have these in a way of importance or chronology. I just had to put them out on a list here. So I would think a lot of these things would be happening simultaneously. But number three, or letter C, what you see here is one second after the rapture, the earth will be in a position to identify the Antichrist. The Antichrist, I think, will be fully unveiled, fully disclosed. Now, you'll notice 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. I guess we could start there. Currently, today, and today is August the... Anybody remember? 15th, well, midway through the month. August 15th, 2021, 9.54 a.m. Central. The Antichrist cannot be unveiled. The Antichrist cannot be identified. And the reason why the Antichrist right now in this split second, this side of the rapture, cannot be identified is because of something called the restrainer. 
Paul the Apostle tells us about the coming Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3. But then Paul explains that the Antichrist cannot be unleashed because the restrainer is currently doing his work of restraint. So Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 6 and 7, and you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So Paul is very clear that we're not to be focused on the Antichrist, the side of the rapture, because we have no idea who he is, because God has currently put a restraint in the earth inhibiting the Antichrist from coming to power. So you might remember in the course of our study, we said that the major interpretive issue here, obviously, is who is this restrainer? Earlier in the series, I gave you the reasons why I think the restrainer is the third member of the Trinity, God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the restrainer. Now, why would we think that? Well, whoever this restrainer is, he's got to be greater than the devil because the Antichrist is going to be Satan's man of the hour. Satan will express himself through the Antichrist in a way that he's never expressed himself through a person. So whoever this restrainer is, uh, the restrainer has to be greater than Satan himself. And only God is greater than Satan. And so God, the Holy Spirit, is a natural explanation concerning who the restrainer is. In the Greek language, and I've got it bracketed there, you'll notice that the participle restrainer moves from the neuter, verse 6, to the masculine, verse 7. And that's a tremendous description of the Holy Spirit because the word for spirit is the Greek word pneuma, Greek word, Greek noun pneuma, which is neuter. But Jesus in the upper room typically used the pronoun he or him when talking about the Holy Spirit. He would say things like, when he comes, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So you'll notice in the Bible that the Holy Spirit can be neuter when it's referred to as the Greek noun pneuma. But it can also be masculine because Jesus uses the masculine pronoun he or him when referring to the Holy Spirit. And so understanding the restrainer as the Holy Spirit handles very nicely the switch from the neuter to the masculine since the Holy Spirit is known by both. Now most people, when they reject this interpretation that the restrainer is the Holy Spirit, never comment on the switch in gender. But I think only our view handles well that switch in gender from the neuter to the masculine. And we know that the Holy Spirit from other passages is doing a work in the world. See, the Holy Spirit does things in the church. He does things through you and your life. But he also has a ministry in the world at large. Clearly that's true because prior to the flood, Genesis 6 verse 3 tells us that the Spirit was striving with man. So the Holy Spirit wasn't just working amongst God's people. The Holy Spirit was at work in the world for 120 years prior to the flood, Genesis 6, verse 3. And even now, as I speak, the Holy Spirit is convicting, which means persuading, the world of three things. John 16, verses 7 through 11. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. Sin, Jesus says in John 16, verses 7 7 through 11, because they do not believe in me. So the Holy Spirit right now is not trying to morally reform the world. 
Uh, he's not working in the lives of unbelievers to prevent pornography, abortion, spousal abuse, um, foul language. Now, presumably, when a person gets saved and the Holy Spirit enters them, then the Holy Spirit will start to convict them of those various sins. But as I speak today, that's not what the Holy Spirit is doing in the unsaved world. Rather, he's persuading them, John 16, verses 7 through 11, of their need to believe in Christ. And so Lewis Berry Chafer had a term for this. He called it true evangelism. In other words, tailoring one's evangelistic message in a way to fit what the Holy Spirit is already convicting the unsaved world of. And that's why we have to be very clear on the, what message we're sharing with the lost. <clears throat> because when you listen to a lot of so-called gospel presentations, uh, what you find is the language that people use, you know, walk an aisle, uh, sign a card, you know, all these kinds of gimmicks that people uh, uh, use, really have absolutely nothing to do with what the Holy Spirit is convicting people of. The Holy Spirit is not convicting people of their need to walk an aisle or to join a church or to fill out a card or to try harder in life. What he's convicting them of is the single sin that they are currently committing against God, which will have eternal ramifications if it's not corrected. And that's the sin of unbelief. So when we share the gospel, we want to make sure that our message is aligning with what the Holy Spirit's already doing. And when you align your message with what the Holy Spirit is already doing, what you start to discover is suddenly your evangelistic message has fervency and power that it didn't have before. Because now your verbiage is cooperating with the Holy Spirit. And Lewis Berry Chafer called that true evangelism. But it wasn't my purpose to go that direction, although understanding that can be very helpful. I'm just trying to show you that the Holy Spirit is active in the world. He's active in God's people with a different ministry, but he's also active in the world. And 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 6 and 7 is describing something that the Holy Spirit right now is doing in the world. What is the Holy Spirit doing right now in the world? He is currently holding back the Antichrist so he cannot come to power. And we believe that this ties in directly with the rapture of the church because where does the Holy Spirit live currently? Remember our chart here? Far right hand column, blue side there. Where does the Holy Spirit live? He lives within the believer. John 14 verse 17. How long is he in there for, by the way? Forever, going down on the far right-hand column, John 14, verse 16. So you put the data together and you start to learn that the Holy Spirit is using the existence of the church on the earth to prevent the Antichrist from coming forward. The Holy Spirit doesn't need us to do that, but he is currently using us in that regard. So our very presence on the earth is preventing Satan from unleashing upon planet Earth his man of the hour, the Antichrist. That's what Paul is getting at in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 6 and 7, when he's telling the Thessalonians who had received a forged letter, allegedly coming from Paul, thinking that they were in the tribulation period, He's saying you can't be in the tribulation period because the Spirit through your lives is stopping the Antichrist from coming forward. And you can't have the tribulation period until the Antichrist enters into the peace treaty with unbelieving Israel. So all of that to say, what is happening right now is the Antichrist cannot come on the scene. This is why it is a complete and total waste of your time, this side of the rapture, 
to try to figure out who the Antichrist is. You know, there's a lot of people out there that think they've got him identified. Uh, when I was coming of age as a Christian, you know, they all told me it was Reagan. He was the Antichrist, which disappointed me because I proudly voted for Reagan twice. Um, actually once, because he ran in 1980 and 1984. I don't think I became voting age until 84, come to think of it. But they would say Ronald has six letters in it, Reagan has six letters in it, and Wilson, his middle name, has six letters in it. So 666, Reagan is the Antichrist, and then Saddam Hussein came on the scene, he must be the Antichrist. Gorbachev, because after all, he's got that birthmark on his head, you know, that makes him the Antichrist. And on and on it would go. And then Bill Clinton came on the scene, and by then I had wised up, and I said, well, there's no way Bill Clinton could be the Antichrist for the simple reason that the book of Daniel says the Antichrist will not be a lover of women. So that would... <laughs> that ruled or have the desire women so I don't think Clinton would really qualify so that's a little bit of tongue-in-cheek but the truth of the matter is if you go back in history everybody thinks they know who the Antichrist is and they're ignoring what Paul said in 2 Thessalonians 2 verses 6 and 7 you can't know who he is as long as the restrainer is here now here's a quote from Irenaeus Irenaeus is one generation removed from John, who wrote the book of Revelation. John discipled Polycarp. Polycarp discipled Irenaeus. And so if anybody would understand the mind of John, who wrote the book of Revelation, it would be Irenaeus in his book Against Heresies, and in this particular section, he tells people all the way back in his day to quit wasting your time trying to figure out who the Antichrist is. I mean, is it Nero? Is it Domitian? Is it Gorbachev? Is it Saddam Hussein? Is it Ronald Reagan? Etc. So Irenaeus says, we will not, however, incur the risk of pronouncing positive, positively as to the name of the Antichrist. But if it had been necessary to announce his name plainly at the present time, it would have been spoken by him who saw the apocalypse, John. For it, that's the apocalypse, <clears throat> was seen not long ago, but also in our time at the end of the reign of Domitian. Take Domitian and just tuck it into your memory banks for a second because that name is going to become important in just a minute. But you'll notice that Irenaeus says, don't speculate as to who the Antichrist is because if John wanted you to know who the Antichrist is, he would have given you his name, which he does not do in his book. And I think one of the reasons Irenaeus says that is this side of the rapture, we can't know who the Antichrist is anyway. However, Satan, the thing to understand about Satan is he is a created being. You see that in Ezekiel 28, verse 13, which I believe is a description of Satan's fall. Go back into our angelology series to get pr what, what, what I consider proof of that. But Ezekiel here says of Satan, uh, it makes a game-changing comment. He says of Satan, on the day you were created... And then when you go down to Ezekiel 28, verse 15, it says you were blameless in your ways from the day you were created. The very most important thing to understand about Satan is he is a created being. Because he is a created being, he, does, he is not God. He's more powerful than we are, but he's not God. And he lacks the attributes that only belong to God. Three of those are the omnis, as we call them, which is not a hotel we're speaking of here, but omniscience, science, knowledge, all-knowing. Satan is not omniscient. 
Satan is not omnipresent. He is not everywhere at once. And he is not omnipotent. He is not all-powerful. Those are attributes that only belong to God. And you know Satan is limited in that sense because of the repetition of the word created in Ezekiel 28, verse 13 and verse 15. Because Satan is not all-knowing, because he is not omniscient, he himself does not know when the restrainer is going to be taken away. He knows it's coming, but he doesn't know when. Satan does not know the date of the rapture any more than you know it or any more than I know it. And so I believe what the Bible teaches is that Satan, because of his lack of omniscience in every generation, has always had someone waiting in the wings. That's why Adolf Hitler, gosh, looked a lot like the Antichrist, even though he never became the ultimate Antichrist. He probably, as far as I can tell, was the guy that Satan had waiting in the wings should the restrainer be removed in that generation. That's why so many world leaders, you, you look at the things that they say, and how they act, <clears throat> and you wonder if they're auditioning for the job. I mean, they sound so anti-Christ-like. And I believe that's so, whether it's Mussolini, Hitler, Nero, any person in world history, you can name a few today. Some of them became American presidents, but I won't go into that that, my goodness, they sure look an awful lot like the Antichrist. And I am thinking, well, though that guy could be the Antichrist. Very well could be. But it's, it's not the generation yet for the restrainer to be removed. So Satan has always had someone waiting in the wings. And that is going to be the reality until the restrainer is removed. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3 talks to us about the man of lawlessness. That's the Antichrist. It says the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3. But then verse 7 of 2 Thessalonians 2 says, for the mystery of lawlessness is what? Already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So before the man of lawlessness comes upon the scene, there's going to be a mystery of lawlessness in the world. And I would understand that mystery of lawlessness as the fact that Satan has always had somebody ready to jump into the part, should that be the generation when the restrainer is removed. Uh, over in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 3, it says, Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming. So there's coming an Antichrist, both Paul and John tell us. But then he says, and now is already in the world. So before the big Antichrist shows up, Papa Antichrist, there's going to be baby Antichrists that will precede his coming. So why is our world littered with potential Antichrists? It relates to the fact that Satan lacks omniscience. He knows that the restraint is going to be removed one day via the rapture. He knows that the Antichrist is going to come forward. He knows that he is handcuffed to a certain degree today. But one of these days, the handcuffs are going to be taken away and he's going to be allowed to unleash his man of the moment. And so he's always had someone ready to fill the part. That's why so many people in the world today look like potential anti-Christs. So that is the condition of our world this side of the rapture. Satan wants the handcuffs off. He knows they're going to come off. He, he's always had somebody ready. But one of these days, the handcuffs will be taken off. <clears throat> the restraint will be removed. 
the Holy Spirit's unique role that he is doing today of restraining the world through the, through the church, restraining the coming of the Antichrist through the church will be taken away and finally Satan will be allowed to unleash his person on the earth. And once he unleashes his man of the hour, so to speak, the whole world will have the ability to point to him and say, that's the guy. How do we know that? Because of what it says here in Revelation 13, verses 16 through 18, concerning 666. You know this passage of scripture well. But most people greatly misunderstand what it's saying. It says, and he, that's the Antichrist, (laughs) causes all, the small and the great, the rich and the poor, the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. He provides that no one will be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark, either The name, you should circle and underline in your Bible the word name. It's repeated twice here. The name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For the number is that of a man and his number is 666. In other words, he's giving us not us, we won't be here, but the earth dwellers, a numerical formula concerning how to identify the Antichrist once the restraint is removed. And it relates to something that's not common in Western thought, but it is very common when you study biblical languages. There is something in biblical languages called gematria, And what that basically means is every letter, whether it's Hebrew or Greek, can be assigned a number. So you can take someone's name in Hebrew or Greek, spell it out, attach the right number to the right letter, add up the digits and it will yield the number 666. In other words, when the Antichrist shows up after the restraint is removed, the whole world will have the ability to know exactly who this Antichrist is because you'll be able to take his name, whatever it is, and don't ask me what his name is because I don't know. But you'll be able to take his name, you'll be able to pull out this gematria table, which is common knowledge in ancient languages, you'll be able to attach the right number to the right letter and you add up the digits and it will equal 666. This is a reality not just in Hebrew, but it's a reality in Greek. So, you know, one night I couldn't sleep very well and my wife asks, well, what's wrong? I said, I'm very nervous. She said, what are you nervous about? And I said, well, I'm nervous because I think I might be the Antichrist. (laughs) Wasn't the greatest week I had had and so maybe, in fact, I was the Antichrist and didn't know it. Isn't that a terrible thought? And I wasn't walking in the spirit at the time I had this thought. So I went downstairs, I pulled out my table I spelled out my name in Greek, and fortunately, whew, it didn't add up to 666. And there's been some people in this church I thought might be the Antichrist. <laughs> I won't tell you why I thought that, but. So I pulled out the table, spelled out their name in Greek. Okay, that person's okay, they're not the Antichrist. But you see, eventually, once the restrainer is removed, there's going to come upon the scene somebody whose name you can spell it out in Greek. And you can pull out this table, add up the digits, and it will be 666. And the whole world will be able to do this. And so they'll know exactly who the Antichrist is. No ambiguity about it at all. 
Now you might be asking, well, if gematria is true in Hebrew and in Greek, why don't you spell out his name in Hebrew? It relates to the context. When John wrote the book of Revelation, at the end of the first century, on the island of Patmos, he was speaking to the seven churches in Asia Minor, which were pr primarily Gentile, that's Gentile territory. Paul the Apostle had some activity there, I think on his, uh, if I remember right, his third missionary journey. Uh, yeah, third missionary journey, if I've got that right, Acts 19. You might want to double check me on that. But at any rate, this was territory which was non-Jewish, it was Gentile, and the people in those churches all spoke Greek. So since John is addressing a Greek-speaking audience, I believe he is speaking here of 666, spelling out the man's name in Greek and attaching the right number to the right letter, adding it up, and there's somebody coming in world history who will have that number 666. That's why... There is such severity in the tribulation period associated with taking the mark of the beast. The reason it's so severe to take the mark of the beast during that time period is you're making a conscious decision to reject Jesus Christ and follow the Antichrist. It won't be a mistake. It won't be a goof up. The whole world will know exactly who he is. And if you take the mark of the beast, not you, but the people on the earth during this time, then they are essentially consigning themselves to e eternal damnation. You'll find that over in Revelation 14, verses 9 through 12, which says that another angel, a third one, followed him, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink, and it's very harsh what God says here, he will also drink of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. He will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. Those who worship the beast and his image, whoever receives the mark of his name. And then it talks about perseverance is needed in, these, in this time period to avoid this mark. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. I mean, why is that language so harsh? It has to do with the fact that after the removal of the restrainer or the restraint and the Antichrist comes forward and everybody knows exactly who he is through gematria, everybody will have a clear identity of who the Antichrist is. If you take the mark during that time period, you are rejecting the God that made you and you are aligning with the Antichrist. Now, I hope this comforts you because I get so many emails related to social security numbers, you know, oh my, oh my, my social security number is such and such. In fact, in my own phone number, my own home phone number, there's three sixes in it. And that kind of makes me nervous. But on the other end of the stick, my zip code has three sevens in it. So I kind of felt like that made up for it a little bit. And, and particularly all this stuff with Bill Gates and the vaccine and mandatory vaccinations and people are really afraid that, oh my goodness, gosh, if I, if I take those things, um, am I somehow consigning myself to hell? The answer is, first of all, your decision to take the vaccine or not take the vaccine, that has nothing to do with the mark of the beast. 
the mark of the beast is something that cannot come into existence until after the restrainer is removed, the Antichrist comes forward, and everybody knows exactly who he is. Now, I think, should I, should I take the vaccine? Should I not take the vaccine? I mean, there's some good point, counterpoint arguments to consider on all of that. And not to sidetrack too much on it, but I think one side of the equation is largely being censored. So you really have to hunt and peck to do good research on that. I have my own conviction on it, but it has absolutely nothing to do with the mark of the beast. You know, the vaccine and all of these things people are pushing there, the best it is, is psychological preparation for the mark of the beast, but it's not the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast is not something that can come into existence until subsequent to the restraint being removed. The Antichrist comes forward and through gematria you can pinpoint exactly who he is. So you need not panic about, did I consign myself to hell if I took the vaccine? That should be a non-issue in your mind. There's other issues you should consider, but not that one. And so this is why this very harsh, this very severe language is being used to describe those that take the mark during the days of the tribulation period because the Antichrist is going to be readily identifiable to the whole world, I believe at least, well, maybe less, one second, a split second after the rapture because the restraint will be removed. Now, I did my master's thesis on this, and so I'm probably going into more detail than you're interested in, but there are people today that they call themselves preterists. <clears throat> Preterist is from the Latin word meaning past or gone by. Um, the late R.C. Sproul was a preterist. It's not a matter of mishearing something he said over the radio. He has a full length book on it where he believes that most of the book of Revelation already happened. He's got a few shreds for the end. He's called now a partial preterist. But there are people out there and they're, they're getting very bold about this and they're getting very aggressive about this and basically what they're saying concerning the book of Revelation is nothing to see here folks, move right along because the book of Revelation has already been fulfilled. So these are people that believe that John penned the book of Revelation in the 60s, not during the reign of Domitian, remember I told you to remember Domitian's name, but in the reign of Nero. He penned the book not in AD 95, but in about AD 65, and the book of Revelation, what it really is, is it's a prophecy that already happened when Rome invaded Israel in AD 70. Preterist, preterism. It's past, it's gone by. All of you people looking for a future antichrist, you're wasting your time because the book of Revelation already happened. Um, Hank Hanegraaff was a convert to the doctrine of partial preterism. And one of the things that's very interesting about preterists, whether it's R.C. Sproul, Hank Hanegraaff, they are arguing that the beast was Nero in the 60s. No future Antichrist, but the beast already came forward in the person of Nero. And look at how they appeal to gematria. You take the Hebrew letters, did I say Greek or Hebrew? Hebrew. They take the Hebrew letters from this gematria table. They spell out the name Nero. And actually, they don't just spell out the name Nero. They throw in his title, Caesar. Neron Kaiser, I guess would be how you would say that. 
and they attach the right number to the right letter and they add the whole thing up and it yields the figure 666. So what they're arguing is Revelation 13 already happened in the back at the end of the first century or even uh, not even at the end of the first century in about the AD 70. And so many, many people are buying into this sort of explanation. And there's a lot of problems with preterism, not the least of which they used Nero's title. Those are the final three letters at the bottom to make this work. They didn't just use Nero's name. Why did they throw in his title? Because without the title, it doesn't add up to what? 666. So they're uh, massaging the data to get it fit their preordained outcome. To convince the Christian world that there is no future Antichrist. The Antichrist already came in the person of Nero. Now this is obviously problematic because of the repetition of the name. When this figure comes forward, you'll be able to figure out who he is, not based on his title, not based on Mr. or Dr. or President or Ambassador or whoever in front of his name. You will be able to figure out exactly who he is from the name itself. That's why the Greek word name is repeated here in the Mark of the Beast passage. He provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name. Now, do you see anything there about a title? doesn't say anything about a title. Or the number of his name. Here is wisdom who has understanding, the number of the beast, that is the number of a man. <clears throat> so the preterists are right that he is a man. The Greek word anthropos is used to describe him. But they're wrong in the sense that they get 666 to work out mathematically the, the way they want it to work out because they, the name Nero doesn't yield the total that they need. So they got to toss in his name. So it's very suspicious what these preterists have done. Beyond that, they have to rely on Hebrew gematria when John wrote to a what speaking audience? Greek-speaking audience. That's your second clue that what they've done here is highly problematic. They've thrown in the title. They're relying on the wrong language. If this had any validity at all, uh, Nero would have to be spelled out in Greek, not Hebrew, and you'd have to get rid of the title in front of the name Nero. Beyond that, who ever thought that Nero was the Antichrist? Has anybody in church history ever told us that Nero is the Antichrist? Answer, crickets. No church father. Polycarp didn't think that, and he was living through Nero's reign, which wasn't a nice time to be alive uh, from a human perspective for a Christian. Severe martyrdoms, but nobody ever said Nero is the Antichrist. And what's so funny about these preterists is they're the first to give you these long-winded explanations. I mean, these people go on and on and on, page after page after page, telling you why numbers in the book of Revelation are not literal. They absolutely do not take Revelation 20, verses 1 through 10, where it mentions the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ, a thousand-year kingdom called the millennium that's coming upon the earth, they will tell you that that's not literal. Um, why is it not literal? Because we're in the kingdom now. So the number 1,000 is allegorical. Uh, they absolutely do not take any of the numbers in Revelation 7 literally. The 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each tribe, not literal, not literal, not literal. Oh, but what about Revelation 13, verse 18? Oh, that's, that's suddenly literal. 
Why? Because they need it to work out the fact that Nero is the guy. And that's how you could recognize false doctrine because they have to employ inconsistent weights and measures interpretively to get it to fit their preordained outcome. And beyond that, the book of Revelation was not written in the days of Nero, but it was written in the days of who? Remember I told you to tuck that memory, that name in your memory? It was written in the days of Domitian. Domitian ruled at the end of the first century. Nero was in power around the AD, AD 60 and following. Now, how do I know that the book of Revelation was, by the way, let me back up. Do you see how that's a big problem for preterism? How can the book of Revelation be a prophecy about Nero when it was written 25 years after Nero? That's, the, that's their problem. Why do I believe that the book of Revelation was not written in the 60s, but after the time of Nero? Because of what Irenaeus says. Irenaeus would know. Because Irenaeus is one generation removed from John, the author. See, R.C. Sproul might seem very glib and articulate and Hank Hanegraaff as they're rattling off the, this position and they sound very authoritative and they sound very scholarly and they use big words and it impresses a lot of people, but they're critiquing something way too late, 2,000 years too late, why not rely on the witness who's just one generation removed from John? And what Irenaeus says, look at the very last sentence here of a quote we mentioned earlier where he tells people not to speculate about the Antichrist. In fact, let me just reread this quote to you. We will not, however, incur the risk of pronouncing positively as to the name of the Antichrist, but if it had been necessary to announce his name plainly at the present time, it would have been spoken by him who saw the apocalypse. Who was him that saw the apocalypse? John. What does apocalypse mean? It means the book of Revelation. Then Irenaeus says, for it... What is the nearest antecedent to the it? If you can discover the nearest antecedent to the it, you'll discover what the it is referring to. And the nearest antecedent to the it is the word what? It starts with an A. Apocalypse. So when he says it, he's talking about the book of Revelation. For it was seen not long ago but also in our time at the end of the reign of Nero. doesn't say that. At the end of the reign of Domitian. This was not written in the AD 60s, the Apocalypse, which is the it. The Apocalypse was written in the 90s. How do I know that? Because of what Irenaeus says here. And he would know, being one generation removed from John, being discipled by a man that John discipled. John, the apostle, discipled Polycarp. Polycarp discipled Irenaeus. And so just one generation removed from John, Irenaeus is saying here, the apocalypse was seen at the end of the reign of Domitian, which means the book of Revelation was written 25 years after the events of A.D. 70. That's a quarter of a century. And so if the book of Revelation was written 25 years after the events of A.D. 70, how in the world can you make the book of Revelation a prophecy about the events of A.D. 70? It would be like me saying, okay, I have a new prophecy book that just came out. Brand new book. This is a real book I wrote, but let's pretend this is a fake book. It's got my personal prophecy in here about what's going to happen on 9-11. 
So everybody line up at the back of the church. We'll be letting these go for a, a very decent rate. I predict in here what's going to happen in 9-11. You're going to say, well, wait a minute, Pastor, 9-11 already happened. That's the preterist view. So <laughs> the more you scrutinize what these guys are saying, the more it makes no sense at all. But because they're on the radio and they speak with authoritative voices, Christian after Christian after Christian believes their message, and their message is stick a fork in it, it's done. Revelation 13 is done. No future Antichrist, no future New World Order. All of that would happened in the person of Nero. And look, even his name spells out to 666. So to get their whole system to work, they've got to rely on Hebrew gematria rather than Greek gematria. Problem there, because John is writing to a Greek-speaking audience. Number two, they've got to throw in the title of Nero to get it to work. Number three, there is no apostle or church father that ever thought Nero was the Antichrist. He was a bad dude, don't get me wrong. But he was not the Antichrist. Number four, why is the number 666 literal when you're telling us in all of your treatises that every other number in the book of Revelation is non-literal? And then number five, how can the book of Revelation be a prophecy about the events of A.D. 70 when it was written 25 years after the fact? Uh, in fact, here's... Um, a chart. I think I got this from Mark Hitchcock. You know, if you really ever want to get, get up to speed on this, there's actually a formal debate that I was in the audience to witness firsthand um, between Mark Hitchcock and Hank Hennegraaff concerning the date of the book of Revelation. Mark Hitchcock, having written his doctoral dissertation on it, arguing for the Domitianic date, Hank Hanegraaff arguing for the Neronian date. And I just have to say, as an observer, this was promoted as a debate. I mean, it really turned into a big deal. John Ankerberg came with all of his cameras and all of this kind of stuff. If you watch that, it isn't even a debate. You know, Hanegraaff, for the first, they each had a chance to make an opening statement. It was one of the weirdest, to be honest with you, I felt like I was in the twilight zone watching this. Hank Hanegraaff gets up there and makes his opening statement, and he doesn't even surface any side in his side of the debate. What he does is he, it's just so weird, I can't even believe I saw this. And you could watch it on film and be your own judge. But he quotes Revelation chapter 1 from memory. Well, Hank, we all know you've got a good memory and you've got a lot of Bible verses committed to memory. What does that have to do with the price of tea in China? That doesn't prove your point at all. Mark Hitchcock gets up there with all of these facts and figures. And um, what was supposed to be a debate wasn't even a, a debate at all. So go to the website www.pre-trib.org. I think this took place maybe back in 2005, something like that. And you can see exactly what I'm talking about. But Mark Hitchcock, one of the most articulate defenders of the Domitianic date for the book of Revelation, would, would put up charts like this. And you'll notice that starting with Irenaeus, going through all of these church fathers, all of them believed that, that the book of Revelation was written in the days of Domitian. There isn't anybody who believed that the book of Revelation was written in the 60s until 550 AD. To look full five centuries and more after the canon of Scripture closed. So the problem with the preterist interpretation is they've completely hitched their wagon to something that no church father believed. And when you ask preterists about this, man, they, they can bob and weave 
and play dodgeball. The closest I've ever gotten to an explanation from them is they say Irenaeus made a mistake. And just like dominoes in a row falling over, Victorinus made the same error. And so did Eusebius. And everybody had it wrong until 550, which is absurd to to think that. But that's what they have to promote to get their system to work, that the book of Revelation was written early and was a prophecy about A.D. 70. By the way, Nero never ushered in persecution for exactly 42 months. Nero never controlled the entire planet the way the Antichrist will. Nero never forced people to receive a mark on their right hand or their forehead in order to participate in the global economy. The best Nero did is he offered up images, plural, of himself. But Revelation chapter 13 verse 15 says this of the Antichrist. He deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image, icon, singular noun, to the beast. You never find Nero in any ancient writing setting up a singular image of himself. It's always in the plural, images. Nero never resurrected from the dead. He was never dead and made alive again through satanic power. And you'll notice in the parenthesis, I've got all of the verses describing what the future Antichrist will do. Nero never associated with a miracle-working false prophet. And Nero was never venerated by the entire world. So who was Nero? He was a baby Antichrist. If the restrainer had been removed in his day, maybe he could have ended up being the main guy. But the restraint wasn't removed in his day, and Nero was just a baby Antichrist, or a little Antichrist, because Papa Antichrist is on his way, and will be visible to the entire world once the restraint is removed. So my goodness, we didn't get too far here, did we? That's the problem when you get preachers talking about their dissertation subjects. You can't get them to shut up. So what is the world going to experience one second after the rapture? A, a perverted explanation concerning the missing. B, there's a shift in God's program from the church back to Israel and the Holy Spirit will take on a more limited role. C, the world will know exactly who the Antichrist is through gematria and the next time I'm with you we'll see that the world will rapidly move into global governance the seeds of which are being planted now, but we are not yet in the new world order. So all of that to say, let's pray, amen. Father, we're grateful for your word, your truth. It's so easy to get off track and get into kind of weird ideas in, about the end times. So I pray that you'll protect us from that as we seek to rightfully divide your word and live the way you'd have us to live in these last days. We'll be careful to give you all the praise and the glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen, happy intermission.